Hello and welcome. My name is Steve Branham. I'm a software engineer with Simply Safe, and my presentation today is testing is how you avoid looking stupid, which is a little bit in your face, but that's because we keep having reports in the media of systems that fail when they shouldn't. So testing is one way to address that problem. I'll go through a brief introduction of testing for IoT today. It's not going to cover everything, but if you have a thorough testing regime in place already and you feel that I've missed something, let me know and I'll learn from you. So I'll go ahead and start sharing presentation here. So there you have my email if you would like to send me any follow-up after this. So first let's talk about motivation. We have the IoT triad, which is the three sets of testable components. We have the IoT devices, which are embedded systems out in the field. We have the back end, which consists of servers. It could be monolithic servers. It could be microservices. And there will probably be a series of admin tools as well uh, running in the back end and per perhaps some data mining applications, things like that. And then we have the front end apps, which are the web, desktop, and mobile apps that your users are using directly. So notice that the back end here is running on IoT provider premises equipment, maybe deployed in the cloud, maybe on physical hardware. And all the rest of the stuff, the IoT devices in the front end is running on customer premises equipment, which means it's out of your physical control. Now, because all of these things are talking to each other, we have a lot of inherent complexity. So that means there are lots of opportunities all along the way for things to go wrong, despite having really good people working on it. So good staff doesn't mean you don't do testing. Now, what if you have some third party integration? Maybe your back end talks to some third party back end. Maybe your IoT devices talk to third party devices or third party back ends. Maybe your front ends are talking. And all of a sudden, we have this potential combinatorial explosion of complexity. So a lot of things that can go wrong. So IoT in the real world is the things we have to remember, that the things we build have real effects on real people in the real world. It's not just fun gadgets. Now we have home and industrial automation controlling physical objects, including some with potential to cause injury or damage or consume large amounts of resources and potentially release large amounts of energy. We also have implantable devices in the human body. We have autonomous roving devices or robots. We also have a lot of integration with personal financial resources like credit cards, electronic bank account access, automatic payments, things like that. We have a responsibility to build safe products that don't adversely affect our customers or those around them. And one thing that I've found over 30 years of work is that never underestimate your customer's ability to use, abuse, misuse, and confuse your products. So good testing is critical. Testing is the due diligence that closes the engineering loop to verify proper behavior. It's also a defensive mechanism to catch things going wrong in the midst of all that complexity. Now, this has a cost that's often perceived as pure overhead. So people try to minimize that cost or postpone it. Bad idea. Not testing can incur unintended costs that far exceed any cost savings you may have achieved by avoiding testing. Now, a reality check. There's always a risk of problems slipping through, no matter how rigorous and thorough the process is. That's just the way things are. No single type of testing covers all the bases. It requires a multi-dimensional approach, and that's one of the things I'll be going through here. You can't test high quality in, but you can verify it's there before someone else discovers that it's not. So we have to be pessimistic. An IoT ecosystem is complex with a lot of moving parts. That means lots of opportunities for things to go wrong. The goal of testing is to shake out all those things as early as possible. You don't want your customers to be the one finding them. You have to assume that untested code is broken code. And that's a really important concept. 
If you haven't tested it, you can't trust it. It will come back to bite you. So you need to be the token pessimist. You need to trust nothing and then verify. And have a nice day. So this takes a lot of commitment. It takes commitment all through the company, from individual developers and through the entire management chain, all the way up to the top. Everyone has to be willing to take the time and invest the resources and actually run the tests. A lack of commitment is a sign that you can expect trouble down the road. This is actually an interview topic for both sides of the table. For individual contributors, this is a factor in evaluating where you want to work and who you want working with you. For managers, this is a factor in evaluating who you want working for you. Cool companies, cool products, and 10x developers don't look so great when they start turning your life into misery due to lack of test discipline. So what are the IoT consequences of failure? We can have deaths, we can have injuries, we can have destruction of property, we can have destruction of personal finances. Overall, this means destruction of lives, unhappy customers, and unhappy investors. Poor testing is a business liability. Here I have some recommended reading that's intended to cultivate the right mindset and develop an appropriate level of paranoia. We want to learn from others' mistakes so you can avoid making them yourself. All of this has happened before, and it will all happen again. Now, if you take nothing else from this presentation, at least take this. Look at Risks Digest. Become a risks reader. The formal title of this is the Forum on Risks of the Public and Computers and Related Systems. And what it is is a, a news service that collects stories of actual death, injury, destruction, and catastrophic financial failure of real systems in the real world. There's 32 years worth of archives of companies and organizations looking stupid. Now, there's a book that's based on the first 10 years of Risks Digest. It has a lot of examples from aviation and transportation, space, defense, security, industrial control, nuclear and electrical power, medical devices, finance, communications, and all kinds of additional fields. All of these are computer-related problems that made life miserable for people. Now, one of the things that comes out of this Risks Digest is a book uh, called Engineering a Safer World by Professor Nancy G. Levinson at MIT. Now, this is getting away from IoT a bit, but it focuses on the end-to-end -end system thinking that's really very appropriate for IoT. It has some case studies of the release of toxic chemicals in Bhopal, India, U.S. friendly fire helicopter shoot down in Iraq, loss of a Millstar satellite launch from Cape Canaveral, and contamination of a public water supply in Ontario, Canada. These are some really scary stories that really happen, and we want to learn how to avoid these problems in the future. This book is available as a free PDF download on the MIT press page, so there's no excuse not to get it. Now, a few more very good books are Working Effectively with Legacy Code, because that deals with a practical approach to the issue of designing code for testability. The book Better Embedded System Software by Philip Koopman is a nice broad overview of embedded systems and good practices, has a nice chapter on testing, and we'll, we'll hear a little bit more about Koopman in a minute. The book Security Engineering, a Guide to Building Dependable Distributed Systems is a large voluminous set of background knowledge for effective security testing. And security testing is becoming more and more important because that's one of our common failure modes. Now, two other good books with chapters on testing and performance are The Practice of Programming and The Go Programming Language. So what is looking stupid? Externally, it means lawsuits, fines, government investigation, how many of your C-level executives want to spend time in the hot seat in front of a congressional investigation? Last week it was Equifax. Who will it be next week? How many of them want to contemplate jail time for negligence? And I mean negligence due to death, due to injuries, due to financial loss. Now also bad press is looking stupid. 
when everybody reads the paper and sees that your product is a mess, they're not going to want to buy it. An appearance and risks digest is something you want to avoid. You'll also lose market share, lose reputation, which means losing market opportunity, and it will increase your level of customer complaints. Internally, looking stupid means loss of reputation and increased friction between groups such as engineering, QA, and customers, customer support, between individual developers, and between management and developers. It results in delayed schedules, delayed releases, extra work to make the schedule, and extra customer support load. So there's a very important case study that is very relevant here. Even though it's not strictly IoT, it's very close to what some of the IoT capabilities are beginning to be able to do now. So this is the Toyota unintended acceleration case where we had multiple deaths attributed to this. In 2013, a jury awarded $3 million to plaintiffs in one of the lawsuits that resulted from this. And then we had settlement talks for hundreds of state and federal lawsuits with estimates of up to $2 billion in legal costs that the company had to pay. In 2014, we had a $1.2 billion settlement in a criminal case with the U.S. Department of Justice. Now, not many companies have the ability to handle these types of, of financial burdens and then look at all the misery that they've caused for their users, for their customers, for the people who drove their vehicles. So here's where Dr. Koopman comes in. Uh, he's a professor at Carnegie Mellon, and he was the plaintiff's expert witness and the author of the Better Embedded Systems book. He has a very nice case study out available in slides on the web and then a blog uh, related to the book and his other work. Michael Barr was another of the plaintiff's expert witnesses. He was on the, the uh, source code review team for this. So he actually examined Toyota's source code on this. He has a very nice write-up about this. And in general, he's an excellent source for a vast trove of very practical embedded systems knowledge. Now, what is the cost of testing? Not necessarily the cost of not testing, which was what the, that case study was talking about, but what does it cost you to do testing? First off, we have to realize that good testing is hard. It takes work and resources. It does not come for free. Achieving the right balance of investment is hard. You have test equipment, which means some sort of test environment, whether it's a real physical environment or some virtual environment. You have to have instances of each of your components from the IoT triad. You have to have multiple separate environments for different types of testing. And then you have to have monitoring and measurement equipment. You also have to have staff. So a portion of your individual product developer's time will be taken by testing. You need to have dedicated test staff, which may be manual testers, test automation developers, and multiple test groups, each with a different focus. So you might have a security test team, a performance test team, a usability test team, and so forth. And then you're going to have over administrative overhead costs. There's going to be bug tracking, staff and equipment management. So there's a lot of things involved here. It's not free. You can also use this as a way of providing feedback into your development process. Use the bug data to strengthen your coding or review guidelines. If you have an immature process with a high defect rate, this should help you cut down on some of those frequent bugs. If you have a mature process with a low defect rate, then when you find a bug, that indicates a gap in your process. Fix the bugs, but also feed that back in and fix the process. Like a teenager, this is how things mature from obnoxious 13-year-old into serious 18-year-old. Let's talk about test coverage. We have a variety of different types of testing, and some of the terms that I use here, you know, you'll see different variations of these in the industry. So don't get too hung up on the specific, specific terminology. Look at the concepts. So functional testing is asking, does it work? Performance testing is, does it work fast enough? And what resources does it consume while it runs? 
load and scaling testing is how does it work as load increases? Endurance or longevity testing is does it work for long duration and how do performance and resource consumption change? Stress testing is how does it respond to stressful load conditions? Security testing, is it secure against attack? Regression testing, do things that were working before still work? And you might think, well, once we've tested it, it's good, right? No, things break again all the time because we continue working on the product. Smoke testing is quick testing to verify basic functionality. Test cases are the way that you exercise the various tests. So you want to use a variety of test cases that exercise as many code paths as possible. You want to exercise code paths within the triad components themselves and the interactions between them, including with any third party components. And that can often be a significant untested area. So in the ideal world, we want to test 100% of everything. But the real world, that's just not practical. You're probably going to achieve 50 to 90%. If you're achieving 95 or better percent, that's really good. But practical test coverage, at some point, diminishing returns make it impractical to achieve additional coverage. The Pareto principle or the 80-20 rule says that 80% of the effects come from 20% of the causes, known as the vital few. So Lowell Arthur says that 20% of the code has 80% of the errors. Fix them or find them and fix them. However, a corollary to this is effort expended on the remaining 80% of the code will only find 20% of the errors. The maddening question is, which 20% should you focus on? Now, at Microsoft, they found that fixing the top 20% of most reported bugs would eliminate 80% of the related errors and crashes in a given system. Pareto distribution is just representative of the effort required to achieve higher cumulative coverage. Now, there's always a tension between the amount of resources to invest in testing versus the return on that investment. Now, I do have a question asks, do you encourage third-party testing or internal testing? And I really encourage both because different people are going to have a different emphasis, a different set of background knowledge, and a different personal interest in the outcome of testing. So here is just a sample representative Pareto distribution that shows cumulative percentage from 0 to 100%. And just imagine that your first 25% of bugs or so is going to cost you 1x dollars, x being whatever unit you think is appropriate here. And as you add another dollar and another dollar and so forth, you're slowly increasing your cumulative coverage. But when you get up here into this high range, now all of a sudden the cost to eliminate those last few bugs starts going exponential. So 10, 20, 40, 80, 100 X might not be unusual. So this gets very expensive once you really get to the end. Now what about coverage gaps? Untested code paths or scenarios represent a risk. There are a technical risk and a business risk. The major problem is that the cost to fix a bug increases the later it is found. Bugs found by customers and shipped products are the most expensive in your direct and indirect costs. So direct costs are what does it take to rework the bug, get a new release out there. Indirect costs are things like lost sales opportunities because your reputation is that you're building poor software. So bug fixes are also an opportunity to add coverage in an area that exhibited problems. These then become your regression tests to verify that problems don't reemerge. I jokingly call this the show me method, meaning that prior to code changes, you want to have test results that capture and exhibit the unsatisfactory, unsatisfactory characteristics, whether it's a bug, performance, whatever. This motivates your effort to correct the issue, and it also addresses Donald Knuth's problem of premature optimization is the root of all evil. After the code changes, capture new test results that exhibit the satisfactory characteristics. 
This demonstrates that corrective efforts have achieved the desired result. If you can't prove that you've done something to improve the results, how can you justify the effort you put in to work on it? Alternatively, how do you know when you're done? Well, if you can show the results before and after, then you know both things. Scope of testing. So you'll commonly see three major scopes of tests described. You have unit tests, integration or subsystem tests, and then system tests. Unit testing is a functional and performance testing of isolated portions of code. And you're really trying to get your smallest executable scope. You can use this as part of test-driven development or some other methodology. The key point here is that incorporating unit testing early in the development process is the goal. You want to make your code work, keep it working as you continue development and make your tests work and keep them passing as you continue development. Backfilling unit tests later for existing code can be very difficult. Technically, you'll have parts that may have been implemented in ways that don't lend themselves to unit testing. This is where Michael Feather is working effectively with legacy code comes in handy. Then you have the attitude. For managers and developers who've been focused on go, 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 it just feels like you're stalling momentum and forward progress to go backwards and fill in those tests. Finally, you have schedule difficulties. When someone says, oops, sorry, ran out of time doing development, can't do any testing. This is related to commitment and attitude. By incorporating this testing early in the process, you build it in and you spread it out over the entire development cycle. So what comprises the unit? You want to break down a complete piece of software into component units. You have classes, algorithms, groups of related functions, so forth. Each unit is characterized by its public interface and its internal implementation. Client components will use that public interface, and the internal implementation is free to change as long as it fulfills the stated functions of that interface. Building these tests is done by the developer who knows the code best. And this is why internal testing is appropriate here. Therefore, you need to account for this in scheduling. You want to wrap the unit test in a test suite that tests all functions of the public interface. Set up the context of the test, then wrap that, uh, sorry, set up the context of the test, then execute that specific code under test. You can wrap the code from any code base in unit tests that run on your development platform. Even if the code is targeted at user interface and embedded platforms that are completely different OS and hardware environment. Not all problems can be shaken out this way, particularly concurrency or real-time scheduling issues, but you can prove out the components on their own. This is also good for driving scenarios to step through in the debugger. Now, if you have dependency on other components, use mocks and fakes. And you want to use a method called dependency injection, which is part of the design for testability. Use unit test tools and frameworks to simplify the process. There's no need to reinvent the wheel on this. There's already plenty of good tools out there. You want your unit test cases to test the positive cases. Those are the happy paths through your code. The negative test cases, the unhappy paths, failure or error paths, the common paths, and the uncommon paths, including the this can't possibly happen in my code paths, test boundary cases, test bad input cases such as bad values, oversized inputs that exceed your buffer sizes or scaling limits, malformed messages, strings and structures, and invalid combinations of inputs. You also want to test the proper API sequence. Often complex APIs require a set of calls to perform something. So also try improper API sequences. Test your expected use cases, how you expect it to be used by client components, and then your unexpected use cases. You may not expect it to be used this way, but if the interface allows it, you better test it. You can drive state machines through all possible transitions. Embedded systems, servers, and apps are all state-based reactive systems using some vari variation of the MVC par paradigm, 
or a data control and management plane. You want to mock event sources and controlled elements. Now, internal knowledge, white box testing is where you can see into the unit. So you have awareness of internal details such as code branches, FSM states, and transitions. You can test to see that each of those branches and transitions is exercised. Black box testing, you can't see into the unit. It's just an opaque black monolith. You can test to see that it meets the requirements and intended behaviors. You want to be careful about allowing your test to have too much knowledge of internals. Avoid special functions or public data that export this information and allow you to peer into internal data. The problem is that this results in brittle test cases that require work when those internals change. You want to stick with the public interface. It's still worth instrumenting your code to allow monitoring at some level of abstraction. That just becomes another part of the public interface, which can itself be unit tested. Now, I have a question here. What to do practically if the system was built without unit tests? Should we rewrite the code with tests or go with end-to-end -end type tests? This is, a, this is a difficult situation, and this is where Feathers working with legacy codebook is good because it, it addresses exactly that problem. You know, ideally, there's, there's really no good answer. Sometimes it's, it's good to go back and insert some tests if you have the time and go through that and incorporate them into the process. Uh, but often the problem is that you've run out of schedule time. Let's talk about unit performance tests. This allows you to do controlled measurement of specific structures and algorithms. Analysis of algorithms predicts your performance. Testing verifies that performance. This also allows you to do A-B testing of different implementations. You can measure your worst case execution time for real-time scheduling analysis. But note that this must be performed on target hardware. Integration testing is the next level, where we do functional performance, load, and stress testing of isolated subsystems. You're answering the question, what happens when you integrate separate units into a large component? That could be within a single executable, between executables, or across communication interfaces. What you do is recursively integrate small subsystems into larger subsystems, stepwise widening the scope. So really, this means that you're applying unit test strategies to these larger components, because really, to some extent, they're just bigger units. A functioning subsystem needs to be tested against real and simulated components. This may be a fully featured subsystem or only partially implemented. Simulators are a huge boost at this point, because what they are is simply an expansion of the mock and fake concept so you have a number of deployment options. You can run them locally as separate processes on your development platform, as separate processes on your test platform. You can spin them up as local or cloud VMs to run them. You can run them on separate hardware, including some version, maybe an incomplete version of your IoT device. Some examples of this are real IoT devices tested against simulated backends and, and apps, Real back-end server tested against simulated IoT devices. Real apps tested against a real back-end server, but simulated IoT devices. So the benefits of simulators are primarily that they decouple development. When the other components aren't ready yet and you need to test your subsystem, the simulator allows you to drive that. You're in complete control of the simulated component, so it stays stable while the other ones are in flux. You can make your simulators follow scriptable sequences or drive unusual behavior. This is a big help in automate, automating testing. You might spin up a VM and spawn off a thousand simulated IoT device processes to connect to your back end. That's great for load testing. Or you might spin up a thousand VMs and start a simulated device on each one. A lot of variability in the way that you do that. Now, the cost of simulators are that they themselves need to be developed and maintained. And inevitably, when you replace the simulators with real components, there will be some issues to iron out. The risks of simulators are that they don't simulate the real components accurately. 
So maybe they're not sending the right message contents. They're not performing the right, right workflows. Their performance and scaling characteristics are way off. Another big risk is that the simulated components grow stale. And then that the simulators themselves become a distraction, just diverting resources from the real shippable product. System testing is per functional performance load endurance stress testing of an entire system. So this is a full stack end to end testing. It can be a full featured system or only partially implemented. Acceptance test is a form of system testing. You're asking, answering the question, is the current state of the system acceptable to ship as a usable version? And you have multi-dimensional acceptance criteria. You can do it using real components with judicious simulator use. You have to be careful about how much simulators you use because they can invalidate the test results. No matter how good they are, they aren't the real thing. So ultimately, you need to repeat testing with real components. The one main use for simulators here is to augment your real components with simulators for sufficient load testing. User interface testing is another very important area. You need to have a sample of your actual user population use the test, not just the engineers who have been playing with it for the past year. Make sure it's a representative demographic cross-section. You're doing functional and performance testing where you're watching for mistakes, mode confusion, and user frustration. Don't blame these things on user error. What you really want to avoid is having people say, didn't these idiots even try to use this before releasing it? You've probably said that yourself about a few things, so you don't want to be the object of that. If a system allows people to do stupid things, they will do stupid things, deliberately or accidentally. So you want to test to find those cases. For execution environments, you want to have separate environments for all of these activities. Now, the production environment is where you're running with real data, devices, and connections. These are real customer resources. The test environment is where you run with test resources. A risky proposition is running in a mixed environment, where you run tests with some mix of real and test resources. The production environment is the company jewels. It needs to be protected. So portions are connected to the public internet, and we all know the barbarians are at the gate. Therefore, security is paramount, including the privacy of customer resources. Safety is also paramount, including the safe operation of customer equipment. You must protect it from external and internal threats. Poor quality is an internal threat. Therefore, good testing is a defensive strategy. Among the test environments, uh, sorry, for test environments, we want to have it completely isolated from public internet, physically or virtually. Now, it may be, you may have things in the cloud, but you should have virtual networks uh, protecting those. Security is provided by isolation and by use of test resources. The outside can't get in, and there's no sensitive data in use. At each scope, you want to have a unit test environment per developer, which is often just their development environment, different integration test environments, and different system test environments. You're probably going to need multiple environments because of the different types of testing that you do at each scope. Isolation between different test environments is important because it prevents interference between tests. Now, a mixed environment. This is risky. What that means is you're mixing some portion of test environment with production environment. So it's probably going to include some connectivity to the public internet. This is a great way to look stupid. Don't do it. The risks are injection of test data into your production environment, which can cause all kinds of havoc. Interference between production service and testing. Corruption of customer accounts. And if money's involved, expect lawsuits. You risk exposure of customer data, including to insiders. Unsafe operation of customer equipment. Disruption of services. This is a great way to DOS yourself. Incomplete security. And remember the movie Star Wars? That's an example of mixing test with production. Sorry. War games. Now let's talk about health testing. 
Don't confuse testing in a mixed environment with health testing and production environment. Built-in service tests use, these are built-in service tests used in normal operation of your production environment, such as active probes, pings, queries, traces, data collection, and so forth. These are all the virtual dials and gauges showing how your production environment is running. This is a whole discussion in itself. The key is you want to know about problems proactively before your customers do. Test automation. There are problems with manual testing. People find it onerous, so they'll skip tests. Very ad hoc with a lot of variability in how it gets done. That means it has poor repeatability. And the results between test runs may not be consistent enough to measure effects. It's also very labor intensive. So tests must be repeatable. This is part of that show me method. Regression testing, you want to be able to verify that things that used to work still work didn't get broken by other work. Therefore, you have to be able to repeat the tests. This often happens over the life of the system as different developers work on it. Repeated testing can also expose issues that were amassed by other issues that have now been fixed. Automation makes it easy. You want to automate everything that can be automated. Ideally, you want to have things be push button automatic. You just need one step to run the test. That makes it easy to repeat, so therefore people will actually do it. It can also be incorporated into your tool chain and build pipelines. For DevOps, you want to be able to provide your developers with push button spin up of virtual test environments. The costs here are the fact that the automation code itself requires development and ongoing maintenance. There's also staffing for that. And then you need dedicated test environments, either real physical ones or virtual ones. The risks, which are also risks of manual testing, are that you only automate the easy stuff. Or the automated suites don't sufficiently exercise enough of the code. Automated suites can grow stale. Poor automated suites lead to a false sense of security. Someone might say, oh, the code is good. It passed the smoke test until someone else says, yeah, but the smoke test doesn't even trigger that functionality. Another risk is that you can have resource contention on dedicated test environments, which blocks development progress. Now, performance and scaling tests have different requirements at different levels of the triad. It's also different for each part of the communication infrastructure. You want your conditions to include normal behavior, what I call happy day testing, and with communication difficulties, bad day testing. Anybody can look good if everything's going right. It's when things that are going wrong that you see the true tests of their metal. So different test types can be intertwined. Load, scaling, and stress tests are really variations of the same things. As your system matures, today's stress test becomes tomorrow's normal load test. Meanwhile, what are the performance and resource consumption in each scenario? Your IoT devices are embedded systems with a range of soft to hard real-time requirements. They may have extremely long duration endurance requirements. They're going to be out there in the field for months to years. They have high fault tolerance requirements. They need to keep working no matter what. But the communications path back to the apps and back end can be very messy. You want to test event rate scaling, stress, and performance. That could be data acquisition scale, uh, event rates, control output and feedback events, communication events, and look for resource contention under high load. Your backend servers have response time and scaling requirements to supply many IoT devices and app instances. When you have a million products out there in the field, that means you've got to have a lot of backend support for that. These will have long duration endurance requirements, fault tolerance requirements, and storage requirements. Now, you may use the Erlang or Google model for endurance fault tolerance, which is treat everything as cattle, not pets. You just kill them off quickly and restart them. If that's the way to do it, test that. Front end apps have human interaction response requirements. They need to be robust across usage and communication problems. Data streaming, uh, they have 
often data streaming requirements from IoT devices, and if they're feeding a video stream, the bandwidth requirements can get pretty large. And you'll have local storage requirements on your local device. The communications infrastructure, you'll have requirements for connection rates, connection load, traffic distribution and balancing, data rates, aggregate bandwidth, latency, and filtering. Now you want to test at varying scales. You want to start with one device and one app instance, and then just go through uh, decimal exponential growth as a progression. So 10, 100, 1,000. Each step may expose pain points in all sorts of places. This is a continuous learning process as you increase the scale. At low scale, you want to be aware of caching effects skewing the results. The results don't necessarily scale up. Large scale testing then becomes practical with real IoT devices just because you don't have enough of them out there. So you scale up with simulators. Synchronizing events are something that you want to test at high scale and ask the question, what is the effect when thousands of IoT devices or apps take some action at the same time in response to an event? This is known as the thundering herd problem. It often poses a transient stress load on the system and can have cascading effects that take a long time to settle out. Examples are server restarts, meaning you just dumped all of your apps and devices off the server, server-side network events, and domain-specific events, such as starting of a live video broadcast or an item going on sale, and all of a sudden, all your customers come piling on. Some important performance parameters are response time to establish connections, response time to perform various requests, request rate, event latency, CPU utilization, memory consumption per connection, memory consumption when those connections are actually doing something interesting, and then within your IoT devices, memory consumption in various interesting cases. And then your device real-time response latency under various conditions. If on the apps, you want to have UI responsiveness under various conditions. Security testing, as I mentioned, has become a big issue. So what are the security threats? First off, security is easy to get wrong and hard to get right. False sense of security is really your biggest risk. Systems come under threat from multiple directions, from outsiders, through the public internet connectivity. They may be trying to breach access into your private and secure connectivity. If they have physical access to IoT devices, they can break into them directly. Social engineering is another big problem because the easiest path in is the low-tech method. Get people to undermine their own security. You don't need to be technically competent to do that. As Bruce Bruce Schneier says, only amateurs attack machines, professionals target people. Now, insiders are a threat because they misuse their authorized access, they may take inadequate steps to secure resources, and they're vulnerable to outside attack. Now, what do the attackers want to do? They want to co-op your IoT devices into botnets. All your 10,000 or 100,000 or a million devices out there are a great target for them. They want to access your customer private data, especially financial data such as credit card and account information. They may also want to get into device data such as recorded imagery. They may want to use your IoT devices against nearby systems and equipment, Stuxnet being a, an example of this type of thing. They may just want to disrupt your customers. They may just want to disrupt your company and business. So for testing, you want to attack yourself. Be sure that the outside world will be trying it. You need to have a devious mind to do that because that's what will be brought to bear against you. And actually, not all developers are really suitable for that just because that's not necessarily the way they think. You want to attack at each concentric ring of security for each part of the IoT triad and all interconnects. You need to assume that outer rings have been breached by high or low-tech means. Therefore, can the next level of defense hold? You want to test to verify that you can trigger your detection, mitigation, alerting, and auditing mechanisms at that level. You want to attack data in flight and data at rest. This is across communications media devices, ports and buses, and in IoT devices and app platform, non-volatile or volatile memory, and in back-end storage, which might be cloud database and file or block stores. 
Very important is you want to use a test environment that matches the security profile of the production environment. Don't use the production environment. Use separate security health monitoring for production. How much time and effort should you invest in this? Well, how valuable are the things you're trying to protect? How much time and effort and money are the bad guys investing in, in attacking it? And what are the potential consequences of security failures for your customer and your company? A bunch of test attacks are various penetration tests of both the IoT devices, the servers, and the apps through connection login paths, traffic capture analysis, script analysis of captured data, uh, test various DDoS attacks, replay attacks, man in the middle, injection and buffer overflow attacks, spoof attacks. You want to try spoofing at each level with factory default, invalid, forged, expired, and stolen credentials, which might be accounts or passwords, one-time pad codes, certificates, keys, etc. Whatever your security mechanisms are, you want to try spoofing them. You want to try spoofing from the IoT devices, from the servers, from the apps. Then on the IoT device itself, you want to try accessing uh, through external ports and also on your app platform. You also want to take one of your physical IoT devices and tear it down and try getting into the component leads or buses and sniffing signals or injecting signals. You want to also look for volatile, non-volatile memory and storage dump. You want to try and load foreign code on your device and get it to run. You also want to do monitoring tests. You want to capture the traffic from all components of the IoT triad. You want to check what they are sending and receiving and who they're communicating with. You also want to scan for open ports. Finally, you want to make sure that you can account for all of this traffic and port usage as valid system functioning. The biggest risk here is that third-party code or insiders may be trying to send data to unauthorized destinations or receive commands from unauthorized sources. Now, the update model for IoT devices is that they're typically over-the-air updatable. Backend servers, because the you as the Builder control them are directly updatable, and apps are usually updatable through App Store or web downloads. You need to maintain compatibility between all triad components at all times in order to maintain control, regardless of version skew. This can get pretty complex. So your test cases are, for functional, you want to do version updates for each component and then version rollbacks, assuming you support that. You want to test partial and failed updates in each direction. You want to test recovery mechanisms for brick devices, and you better have recovery mechanisms for brick devices, otherwise your customers will really get upset. You want to be able to reject unauthorized updates, and you want to test uh, do regression tests after each version test. Make sure that functionally, after you've updated or rolled back, it still works. For performance and scaling, you want to test what happens with a single instance of a component and then with many instances. So what happens during the update and what happens right after the update? You also want to test your rollout model. Is it an expanding model, a regionalized, regionalized model? What? You don't want to be trying to update every single customer all at once. Then you also want to test and see how this affects normal operation. Now, test tools and frameworks are often language-specific. They help to reduce effort in building your tests, and they help you to automate the tests. So here's just a random list of tools that I've seen in use by some of the people I've worked with and some of the work I've done. There are many others out there. So the idea here is just get familiar with some of these capabilities and go seek out the tools that will, will help you with your testing. Thank you for listening to this presentation. I hope you find it helpful. I do want to address another uh, question we have here, and that's uh, system test environment should represent the actual production environment. The network issues and such is not visible in simulated test environments. And so that's another one of the challenges is that you do want to simulate as much of the real network environment as you can in your simulation environment. 
So that's where it's nice to be able to spin up an entirely separate virtual environment, virtual infrastructure that's a, as close a match to your real production infrastructure as you can. Thank you. Thank you.